All right, another uh, set of psychological experiments uh, that bear on our teaching uh, children developmentally, uh, suggesting that they're susceptible to various kinds of psychological pressures, involves a conformity, but not in a horizontal direction, but rather in a, uh, a vertical direction here. Horizontal conformity is uh, doing things because everybody in your social group, your peers, are doing so. Vertical conformity is doing things because someone of a higher social status or social position is telling you right, to do so. So, for example, your parents tell you to do something and you do it because it's your parents telling you to do so. Right? Or your teacher tells you to do so or you're in the military and someone higher in the command tells you to do so. And this uh, then is the, uh, the issue of obedience, right? which is conformity to the commands of uh, those in, in, uh, in higher authority here. Now, there's a, uh, obviously a place for uh, a rational obedience when we are younger. Uh, children do live in an insulated world. They don't know everything to function independently. They don't necessarily know the full context. And so as parents and teachers, our job is to be a buffering zone and to protect them. And in some cases, we don't have the time or this child has not developed enough that we can uh, explain to them so they can understand in the, with their own judgment uh, what the situation is and why what we're asking them to do is the right kind of thing. And so there is a place for obedience as we are growing up. But uh, by the time we are adults, we want to uh, be functioning independently, particularly in the kind of uh, liberal, democratic, republican society that, uh, that we want to have. We want independent people, not obedient people. Uh, how do we wean them off of that childlike obedience to a healthy adult uh, uh, independence? Uh, and there's lots of data that shows that this is, in some cases, a difficult issue for, for children to learn. And of course, we know that many adults are still struggling with this kind of uh, issue themselves. The most famous name associated with uh, testing this and working on it uh, ex experimentally is uh, Stanley Milgram who uh, did a series of experiments uh, involving testing people's predispositions toward obedience or, or to conforming to what various authority figures uh, uh, want them to do. Now, my understanding is uh, that these experiments, you can't really do them anymore. They don't get past the ethics review board uh, because they are judged to uh, have a certain level of cruelty uh, involved in them. Uh, but be that as it may, when these experiments were first done uh, many decades ago, uh, they were uh, very uh, uh, illuminating in a number of respects. So experimental setup to imagine in this case here is uh, kind of an interrogation chamber that we've seen in uh, movies or police drama shows where uh, the police will bring in someone who is to be, uh, to be questioned, but we duplicate that in a, in, a, in a psychological setup. So we have a two-chambered setup here, and there's a, a wall or a partition here, and there is then a piece of uh, one-way glass here so that if you're in this chamber, for example, you can see through the glass into that chamber, but if you're in this chamber, you can't see through into this chamber here. All right, uh, Professor Milgram then will bring in various students, pay them a couple of bucks and say, we want to do uh, uh, various kinds of experiments here, will you help me out? So we'll say, here's a student, I'll put him over here, and here's Professor Milgram. He is the authority figure, so we'll make him a little bit bigger. Uh, we'll give him a clipboard. Right, he's wearing the white lab coat, so he's the authoritative uh, researcher person uh, and so forth. And of course, the, uh, the, uh, the, the student knows that uh, this person is the professor or the, or the guy in charge if it's not actually Professor Milgram himself running this particular iteration of the experiment. Student comes into the room. What uh, he sees through the one-way mirror is someone sitting over here. Lots of variations on this experiment, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll do this one here. Someone sitting on a chair in this other room. Uh, I'll give him a nose and two legs. Uh, and uh, I'll switch colors here briefly. What this person has is various electrodes attached to sensitive points right on his body. I don't know how personal we want to get here with these electrodes, but there are a number of them. And they all come in here, and they come into this room. And then in this room, where the stu student is uh, placed, there is a machine. Okay. And on the machine, there will be, say, a big dial. And below it, it will say voltage. And uh, will indicate right, a range of voltages that are possible here. 
There might also be on this dial right, a zone over here that's the red zone, and there will be the word danger right beside it if the, the dial gets up to that point here. And then uh, we need some sort of uh, lever, say. And what we tell the student is we want you, the student, to uh, operate this machine in conjunction with, with the professor uh, authority figure here. And this, the cover story that we tell the student is what we want to do is test people's uh, uh, ability to concentrate for longer periods of time and whether administering miles amount of pain improves people's concentration and then their performance on various kinds of uh, tasks. So what I'm going to do is I've got my clipboard here, so I'm going to ask this guy a series of questions and if he starts getting a series of questions wrong systematically, I want to uh, uh, give, give him a mild electrical shock uh, to see whether that improves the guy's concentration so whether he uh, uh, performs better on the test. So, a uh, student says, okay, that's fine, that sounds interesting. And so I start reading uh, a bunch of questions here. So I say, uh, who was the author of uh, Romeo and Juliet? And the guy says, Shakespeare. Uh, what is seven times six? And the guy says, 42. When did World War I end? Uh, 1918. And so we go on in this vein, and this guy gets most of the questions right. Occasionally you might get a question wrong. Uh, and then Professor Milgram asks this guy a question, he gets the answer wrong, asks him another question, the guy's gotten two questions wrong in a row. Professor Milgram says to the student, okay, please uh, administer a, a shock. What does the student do? Vast majority of students in this circumstance, experimental setup, uh, will turn the machine on, administer a shock to this person. Now, as it happens, this person is not really hooked up to this machine. This person is an actor uh, hired by Professor Milgram, working with Professor Milgram to uh, uh, simulate uh, being in pain when shocks are, are delivered to him. And at prearranged times, the person is intentionally going to give wrong answers two or three times in a row. And what we're really interested in is what will this student do when he is asked to deliberately inflict pain on another human being because an authority figure told him to do so. And the initial data seems to be, uh, and there's uh, lots of experiments done to, that uh, back this up, is that most students, most of the time in the early stages, will go right ahead and uh, administer uh, an electrical shock or what they think is an electrical shock to that test subject over there. Now, the next variations on the experiment then are to say, okay, uh, this guy then uh, gets the shock, his performance improves, he gets a whole bunch of right answers for the next little while, but then at a prearranged time, he gets another answer wrong, he gets another answer wrong, he gets another answer wrong. Professor Milgram then says, well, uh, I think what I want to do is I want to turn the voltage up a little bit here to see whether just a slightly higher amount of pain will uh, improve his performance here. And so this guy then gets another question wrong. Professor Milgram says, please zap him. All right, he didn't say zap them, but you get the idea. Students, again, majority of them, okay, fine, zap them. Now, in this case, the voltage is supposed to be higher, so this guy might uh, whimper a little bit or yelp, right, a little bit. Uh, we carry on uh, uh, running the experiment, turning the voltage up, right, on occasion. This person might start crying. This person might start saying, please stop, I'm in the, uh, great discomfort, or I don't want to continue. And there still are a significant, or still is rather a significant minority of students who will continue to administer shock even when this person is in obvious distress um, and so on.